In this video, we are going to illustrate the G-protein signaling pathway. That is one of the most important signaling pathways across the cells of our human body. G-protein is an intracellular signaling protein tethered to the inner part of the cell membrane. It is named for its ability to bind to guanosine triphosphate molecule GTP and has GTPase activity as well. There are two families of G proteins described. The one we are talking about in this video is the family of heterotrimeric or the large G proteins, as it consists of three non identical subunits alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha subunit carries guanosine diphosphate GDP molecule when inactive and it has different forms making different types of G proteins accordingly. The signaling process is initiated by a ligand like a hormone or a neurotransmitter binding to a receptor linked to the G protein and hence called G protein coupled receptor or GPCR. The GPCR is a transmembrane protein with seven membrane spanning regions or helices. Upon activation, the GPCR undergoes a conformational change, making it able to interact with the G protein. In response to the receptor binding to the G protein, the alpha subunit undergoes another conformational change leading to the release of guanosine diphosphate molecule and binding of a guanosine triphosphate molecule instead. The G protein is now active and the alpha subunit dissociates from the beta and gamma subunits resulting in an activated alpha subunit and an activated beta and gamma heterodimer. The activated alpha subunit then regulates an enzyme that is membrane bound. This enzyme catalyzes a reaction that produces a second messenger. This second messenger acts like an amplifier to the first signal sent to the cell by the ligand. And this occurs in many cases by activation of protein kinases which are enzymes that phosphorylate certain target proteins, many of which are enzymes too. Changes in phosphorylation status of such proteins alter their activity, carrying out the biological response of the cell to the hormone or the neurotransmitter. According to the type of the alpha subunit, the signal takes a different path since an activated alpha subunit is formed. If the activated alpha subunit is of the S type, this makes a GS protein. And this alpha subunit, when activated, stimulates adenyl cyclase enzyme. This enzyme uses ATP as a substrate to produce cyclic AMP as the second messenger. Cyclic AMP activates cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase A or PKA. The PKA consists of two regulatory and two catalytic subunits. Cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory subunits, enabling the release of the catalytic subunits, which become active when released. The active catalytic subunit enters the nucleus and phosphorylates its target protein, that is, in many cases, a transcription factor. Phosphorylating this transcription factor makes it active and ready to bind to a certain promoter or regulatory sequence controlling transcription of the target gene. On the other hand, as a part of the counteracting mechanisms, protein phosphatases the phosphorylate activated proteins, making them inactive and hence controlling the signaling pathway. Among the target proteins that PKA phosphorylates is the phosphodiesterase enzyme, which hydrolyzes cyclic AMP into 5-AMP, 
making a negative feedback arrangement that keeps the PKA effect brief and localized. It is of interest that this process of signaling transduction is thought to play an important part in some forms of learning and memory. Well, if the activated alpha subunit is of the I type, which means GI protein, it inhibits an allyl cyclase enzyme decreasing cyclic AMP, in response PKA will not be activated which is an opposite action to the GS protein. While if the activated alpha subunit is of the Q type, it stimulates phospholipase C to cleave the membrane lipid phosphatidylinositol by phosphate or the PIP2. The products of this cleavage are inositol triphosphate or IP3 and diacylglycerol or DAG which remains in the plasma membrane. The IP3 is released into the cytosol and binds to an IP3 gated channel in the endoplasmic reticulum causing release of sequestered calcium. Calcium and DAG together activate the calcium dependent protein kinase named protein kinase C or PKC. PKC catalyzes phosphorylation of cellular proteins that mediate cellular responses. IP3, DAG, and calcium are all second messengers in this system. The intracellular calcium effects are mediated by a calcium binding protein called calmodulin. Upon calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum, the transient increase in intracellular calcium concentration favors formation of the calmodulin calcium complex, which binds to the inactive enzyme, making it active. As a part of the negative feedback mechanisms of this signaling transduction pathway, Increase of the intracellular calcium concentration above certain levels inhibits the IP3 gated calcium channels in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Also, formation of the calmodulin calcium complex itself stimulates the calcium ATPase pump present in the cell membrane so that to get rid of the increased intracellular calcium. In general, the G protein signaling pathway could be switched off in different ways. When the ligand is no longer present, the receptor reverts to its resting state, and the G protein exerts its GTPase activity to hydrolyze GTP into GDP, and the alpha subunit will reassociate with beta and gamma subunits to stop the signaling process. Also, another mechanism by which the GPCR firing stops is the inactivation of the receptor itself. When GPCR activates the G protein, it activates at the same time a GPCR kinase or GRK. The GRK together with PKA and PKC phosphorylate the GPCR. A phosphorylated GPCR binds with high affinity to a protein called arestin, which prevents interaction of the receptor with the G protein and couples the receptor to an endocytosis machinery, inducing the internalization of the GPCR. A clinical correlate to this topic is that the cholera toxin produced by Vibrio cholera bacteria alters the alpha S subunit so that it can no longer hydrolyze its bound GTP, causing it to remain in an active state that activates enolyl cyclase indefinitely. The resulting persistent elevation in cyclic AMP concentration causes a large efflux of chloride and water into the gut, leading to severe diarrhea. 
On the other hand, pertussis toxin produced by Bordetella pertussis inhibits the alpha I subunit so that the anilyl cyclase remains active indefinitely too, producing excess cyclic AMP. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.